excited about our new study in the book of Galatians. The ultimate theme we're going to be looking at is freedom in Christ. And there are a lot of facets to that freedom that I'm looking forward to discovering with you. I want to look in verses 11 to 24, chapter 1 this morning. This is a larger section, and um, I'm not going to read the entire thing before I get started here. But I just may mention that we've been seeing Paul's defense of his apostleship, uh, the gospel message. And he's up against uh, a lot of false teachers who were following him through his missionary journeys, and they would infiltrate the churches after he had departed. They would go in and they would try to change the message, challenge the message that Paul had preached to them about the grace of God. So they're invalidating the message in their mind by trying to invalidate the messenger. These Judaizers, of course, uh, accused him of bypassing the law, which he had no authority to do, according to them. That uh, he was basically uh, just a man who received his message from other men, and that he had taken that message, excluded any vestiges of Judaism in order to cater and pander to the Greeks. Now that was entirely untrue. It's slanderous, and it's a, a form of defamation. And typically, you know, when a person is slandered, there's a limit to the impact of that slander. It can very much damage the person who's being slandered, and sometimes it can affect your friends and your family. Uh, there are other forms of slander that might have a broader impact, maybe uh, on a business level. You know, if a CEO of a company gets slandered, it might affect business. It can even happen politically, where slander could uh, be costly to a political party and have a broad impact. But this is defamation of the highest order. Having his apostleship called into question could nullify the authority of the gospel in the eyes of the people who believe that slander. The impact of this is nothing less than the souls of men being eternally condemned. And so Paul takes this slander very seriously. The section that we're about to look at, as you're going to see, it plays out kind of like a defense that's given in the court of law. Now I want to remind you that Paul is all about the law. He's got his PhD, if you will, in the law and the laws and traditions of Judaism. And so he's, he's basically going to defend himself as one might do, do in, the, in courts when they're being slandered. And you notice if you go back to verse 8, something that Paul uh, said it is kind of like launching a countersuit right off the bat against these Judaizers. He says, but even if we are an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so say I again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, he is to be accursed. The fact that he says it twice shows the, uh, the implications, the very heavy implications for those who are preaching a false gospel. The accusation against him is he's a fraud and he's got this countersuit going where he's saying, no, 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 the people who have come into the church and they're twisting the gospel, they're the frauds. And, and there is a pronouncement already made on them by the judge, by God, that they are anathema. And that speaks of God's judgment, his condemnation, that they are under the wrath of God. Of course, he's defending uh, against this accusation that he's the fraud. And you'll notice in this section, I'll just make mention of it now in verse 20, as he's given this defense, he says, Now in what I am writing to you, I assure you before God that I am not lying. So this is, in my mind, very similar to what happens in courts, where you put your hand on the Bible, right? You raise your hand, your right hand, and you're sworn in. You're, you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God. In other words, you're doing this in the sight of God, and... <clears throat> So Paul, in making this statement, he's kind of doing the same thing. He's kind of being sworn in in the eyes of God. But the testimony that he's about to give here is, this is real. This is true. Now, I don't know how to reconcile this, if I'm being honest, with the teaching of Jesus, who said not to swear by heaven or earth, but let your yes be yes and your no be no. But I think the gravity of the situation, because they're dealing with something so important like the gospel, that he's um, solemnizing his testimony making it solemn so they understand. And, and they would have understood to make an oath like this uh, would have been a very serious thing for any person to do. They would have taken it very seriously. So today, in kind of keeping with this idea of him being in a court, if you will, and he's, he's been indicted by these people and he's, he's clearing his name, 
Um, he, he's going to go on record here. So I've got an acronym today for various points that we're going to see this uh, record. And by the way, the definition of a record is a thing constituting a piece of evidence about the past, especially an account kept in writing uh, or some other permanent form. So the, the record is meant to be a permanent record. And here we are thousands of years later, and we have this record preserved for us uh, in the pages of Scripture. And this is going to be very important because what we're seeing here, you might call it case precedence. So when a, a case is won in the court of law, it becomes a, pr a precedent. It establishes a precedent of law so that other cases that are being tried down the line and later on, they come back to that precedent. Uh, and, and that verdict is the one that they, they stand by. And so today, even thousands of years later, we have the same accusations made against the Bible, against us, as were made against the Apostle Paul. That we're just out here uh, sharing the writings of men, calling them the writings of God. And some will challenge it to writings of God. But we have our verdict before us this morning. So let's look at this proof today as we take each um, letter of this word record and we made our points. The first being Revelation. So let's start in verse 11. For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from men, nor was I taught it, but I received it through the revelation of Jesus Christ. You might call this his opening argument, which actually really began back in chapter 1, verse 1, where he said, Paul, an apostle, not sent from men, nor through the agency of men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So immediately he comes out uh, defending himself that I'm an apostle, not by men, but by God. And now he's saying, I've got a message that is not by men, but it's from God. So this statement made in verses 11 and 12, that's this opening statement to the section we're looking at, he, he makes the statement of, of the gist of what he's going to defend, and now he's going to spend uh, the rest of this chapter giving the evidence that validates that statement. Again, he, his claim is that I didn't come up with this gospel, Paul says. This is not the machinations of my creativity. Uh, you know, I didn't just invent this. This was received by me. And it's important that we know who uh, he received it from. I shared this verse last week, a good definition of the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which what? I also received. Where did he receive the gospel? Well, he received it from Jesus Christ. Throughout the book, he's going to defend the substance of the gospel. But here he's, he starts by defending the source. And they're equally important. The source and substance. Both are Christ. And that's the case that he's going to make. He is the source of it. That's where it came from. And he is the substance. In the following chapters, he's going to prove that he didn't receive it from men. And he's going to prove how it was impossible that he could receive it from men, nor was he taught it of men. In other words, I didn't just come to know the gospel because someone told me the gospel. Neither was I taught the truths of the gospel. You know, the gospel is um, it's a simple message, but within that simple message, there's a body of truth. There's a theology in that simple message of the gospel. And he was well-versed in it. And so he's saying I, that this understanding that I have of the gospel, the deeper implications of the gospel, it didn't come because somebody sat down and taught me. He was a man who was raised under rabbis, taught of men, so he knows the difference. He says this wasn't the same as being taught in Judaism. No, no, this was different. I was taught of Jesus. So then he goes on in verses 13 to 14 to talk about his earlier life. In verse 13... For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and try to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. Paul's essentially saying to the churches in Galatia, saying, um, hey, you know that while you're putting me on trial here, and, and you're making these accusations about the, the gospel and my preaching of the gospel, you do recall that I used to be the guy who persecuted and even prosecuted Christians for believing this very same message. In other words, I used to be on that side of the argument, the same side that Judaizers are on, and actually, they've got nothing on me, Paul says. Essentially, 
Uh, I was I was well more versed in the in the law. I've excelled my countrymen in my understanding of Judaism. In fact, Paul would have had these Judaizers in his crosshairs had he still been the old Saul of Tarsus persecuting the church, because just for the simple fact that they accepted the fact that Jesus was the Messiah. Now they got a lot of other things wrong. They got the gospel wrong. Don't even think the Judaizers were true Christians. But nonetheless, just that slight deviation in accepting Jesus as Messiah. And Paul was far more extreme than, than they were. Not only was he a proponent of the law in his past, but also of Jewish traditions. And I think the language that he's using here, it's safe to say that he was probably in the extremist group of Pharisees that there were. And that, those were the very ones Jesus, by the way, challenged throughout his earthly ministry. Always challenging those Pharisees. Why? Because they didn't just embrace the law of God, but they added to it. You know, they had the Talmud, which, uh, and their sacred writings, which were basically, they, they were given to uh, provide guidance on how you should keep the law of God. A lot of those things came out of the uh, years of prophetic silence. They weren't really receiving a word from God, so they just thought they'd make up their own rules, their own laws. And the Talmud, which would, uh, would, um, would lay out the uh, kind of the specific ways in which you kept the law, they were put on equal par with the law itself. That's what Jesus was constantly on a case for. You're making up these laws, these rules, and you're holding people to it like it's scripture. It's the actual truth of God. He says, this is my past. Now, how does a guy get from that point of being so zealous for the law, even, even these little rules they made up about the law, to this point in uh, Romans chapter 3 where he's saying, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. He would affirm over and over that not only are you not saved by law now, people were never saved by the law. It never had the power to save. I'm going to talk more about the uh, Old Testament um, salvation, if you will, and, and how the grace of God has always been the way in which people come to him. The point is, the point that he's making here is that there was a transition that took place in his life, a transformation. How does a guy who's so entrenched in Judaism, in the law, get to the point where he's uh, all into grace, rejecting that the, the law ever had anything to do with salvation? Was there a man who could have convinced Paul that he was wrong about the law? I don't think there was a man that could have done that. And the reason is, you know, you see his persecution of believers. Remember Stephen, the martyr? I mean, here you got a guy who's dying for his faith, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. He preaches this amazing sermon just before he dies, and Paul was there. He was holding the coats and consenting to the death of this man. It's, it says that Stephen's face shone with the, the brilliance of the glory of God. But that wasn't enough to convince the Apostle Paul. I don't think any man had the power to do so. So what he does here now is he is going to present his testimony of how this transformation took place in his life. And he's using a technique which probably has one of the most powerful impacts of any technique a person could use to argue this point of transformation. How many of you have ever um, noticed that marketing companies love the before and after pictures? I mean, think about it. Every product practically you can think of, they found a way to, in two pictures, to help you visualize the importance or the impact of this product that they're trying to sell. So you have all kinds of uh, before and afters that amount to story. That, that the story is powerful. They use it in the court of law when, when it comes time to um, try to clear someone's name. They're, they use story, the testimony of a person's life. And when it comes to the gospel, the story of transformation, the before and the after pick, is compelling. That's why we have testimonies. You know, we had a baptism recently. I had someone bring up the testimonies recently of the, those who were baptized and how powerful that is. I mean, think about it. Some of the testimonies given, some of these young guys were atheists. And they give the testimony of how this 
radical transformation took place. And it's powerful when you see that contrast. And that's what Paul's doing. He's setting up a contrast. When you have a, you know, like a fitness transformation, a before and after, you see a person generally who's out of shape, maybe overweight, just unhealthy in, in general. And then the next picture, they're all shredded and ripped and muscular. And, you, and, and people want to know, how does that happen? What is, what stood between, what's the story between picture one and picture two? So people will pay to learn that story. You know, companies that say, here's the before and after. If you want to know how this is possible, that these people use our program, if you want that program, just to even know what it is, you're going to have to pay for it, and people will pay for it. And people will watch uh, on, on streaming services, a lot of these programs, um, like Biggest Loser or these makeup uh, transformation challenges. or I, I, There's all kinds of them that are being streamed because of the power of story, the power of transformation. And what mar marketing companies tend, tend to do is they interject something, a product, a service of some sort in between those two pictures and say the, the story between these two pictures is this supplement. The story is this workout program. It's this meal plan. Whatever it is. Paul has a before and after picture that he's going to share. What is it that stood in between the Saul of Tarsus who persecuted Christians and this man Paul who is preaching uh, an entirely different message? And the answer to that is found in verses 15 and 16 that he was chosen of God. Verse 15, but when God, who had set me apart from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. There was this singular moment in time, you're well acquainted with this moment, I'm quite sure, when he was on the road to Damascus and had this encounter with Christ. And it wasn't a chance encounter. No, this was predestined. God had a calling for this man. He had chosen this man. He said, from my mother's womb. And the moment he departed the mother's womb, he says, I had this, uh, this choice of God on my life, this calling. And we see the actual calling. I'm going to have you turn here to Acts 26. We know the event happened in Acts chapter 9. It was recorded in Acts chapter 9. But it's also recorded in Acts 26. And this is actually a fuller account than what you see in chapter 9. Let me just mention, if you have the uh, church Bible in front of you on page 956, you'll see the heading of chapter 26, Paul's defense before the group. Here he is again, testifying, clearing his name. This is a legal defense. And by the end of it, Agrippa, King Agrippa, says to Paul, Paul, you almost persuaded me. You almost persuaded me. Well, what was so persuasive about it? It was Paul's before and after picture. Let me, let me show you in verse 4. So then all the Jews, knowing my manner of life and my youth up, which from the beginning was spent among my own nation and at Jerusalem, since they have known about me for a long time, if they are willing to testify that I lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of our religion. And now I am standing trial for the hope of the promise made by God um, to our fathers. Skip down to verse 9. So then I thought to myself that I could do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. While so engaged, I was journeying to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining all around me, and those who were journeying with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet, for this purpose I have appeared to you, 
to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you, rescuing, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles, to whom uh, I, I am sending you, to open their eyes, and so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, and they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been uh, sanctified by me in faith, or by faith in me. So there you see a fuller account of the calling that he gave him. Right, out, right at the outset, he told him what his purpose was. He called him to be a witness, not just before the Jews, but also the Gentiles. I want you to think of the brilliance of God's choice in the Apostle Paul. His master evangelist would be a guy who was already accustomed to defending his beliefs vigorously. His theologian of grace was one who was brilliantly instructed in mind of the law of God. He had mastered the law of the Old Testament. He knew the scriptures inside and out. And God took a man who was well versed in the law and taught him grace. And a man who would have that understanding of the Old Testament law and now this grace of God would be in a position to make the distinctions necessary to help teach us the difference between law and grace. But above all, he chose a man who would initially oppose the gospel so that when he received the gospel, his transformation would send shockwaves throughout the known world. He, he said to Agrippa, by, by the way, there in um, Acts 26, he says, Agrippa, after telling him or showing him the before and after, he says, you, you already know this. You've heard this story before. I'm sure it's come to your ears. The news cycle was a lot slower back then. You know? the, the news of a guy like this getting saved was a big deal. Everybody was learning about this. And I've said it before that Paul's conversion stands as one of the greatest evidences of gospel truth. It, it, that it is true. Because you can't explain it any other way. So after going into the fact that he's been chosen of God, then he gets into an overview of his travels, verse 17 and 18. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. This is Galatians 1, verse 18. And three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas, that's Peter, and stayed with him 15 days. So, so he's giving this account of his life, the, the, the very beginning of his life as a Christian. We know according to Acts chapter 9, it tells us that Right after his conversion, he went immediately to Damascus and started to preach Christ. He already knew the gospel because he had just accepted it. He understood that Christ is the substance of the gospel. And so he's in Damascus for a period of time. He mentions then also Arabia. So there's this, um, I don't know if you can even see that, but uh, the, the Arabia that he's talking about is probably not the same one on our maps today, the Arabian Peninsula. This would have been closer to Damascus, south and east of Damascus. Uh, there was the, the Arabian region, as they would call it. And then he mentions that after being in Arabia, and I'll talk about that more in a moment, he came back to Damascus and then eventually went to Jerusalem. But from the time of his conversion to the time of going to Jerusalem was three years. Why do you think he entered his travels into evidence at this point? Because again, the accusation was Paul had gotten this message from other people, other men, and that was a message of man. And he's basically proving by his geographical location at the time that this was impossible for him to learn it from others because he wasn't around the others. But rather, he was getting it from Christ. He said, I didn't confer with flesh and blood. I didn't immediately go around to see, does my message match their message? Eventually he will. He'll go down to the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15, and, and they will talk very specifically about the gospel, about circumcision, about the law. But presently, he's just taking it in from Christ. And furthermore, uh, he, he goes into the reclusive beginnings, verses 18, the second part there, when he says he went up to Jerusalem, he became acquainted with Cephas, Stayed with him 15 days, but I did not see any other of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now, in what I write to you, I assure you before God that I am not lying, that I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. I was still unknown 
by sight to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. You pause right there for a moment. So he gives his geographical travels in those first three years after his conversion. This is kind of an alibi, if you will, this, of where he was at. He didn't have the time or the opportunity to learn this message from other men. And he further discusses his reclusive behavior, that it wasn't for three years before he went to see Peter. You might think that if you're called to be a leader of the church, that you would immediately go to someone like Peter and you know, get his approval or what have you. But he didn't need Peter's approval because he had Christ. He didn't need to hear the message from Peter because he got it from Christ. And two weeks that he spent with Peter would not have been enough time to learn everything he knew about the gospel. We know his knowledge was deep. I mean, go back to Acts 9, immediately after being converted. He's, he's preaching a strong message already. And that's one of his points. I, I, I started preaching the gospel in those three years before I had even talked to the other apostles or believers. He got this from the resurrected Christ. I said before, this is imperative to his apostleship because the original apostles, remember, they were sent out by the risen Christ. They were commissioned, right? Chosen by him. And Paul had the privilege of also meeting with the risen Christ. He met with him there on the road to Damascus, but apparently he had interaction with Christ for a period of time where he's being taught these truths. He mentions going down into Arabia. I, I always find it fascinating, and, and I think I've probably mentioned it before, but I'd like to do a whole message about it someday, is um, how God's choicest of vessels, it seems many of them, had to go through a period of desert, a wilderness in the early parts of their uh, spiritual formation. Guys like Moses, and Elijah, and John the Baptist, even Jesus went into the wilderness at the beginning. Before their public ministries, God had them spend some time in the desert. And the other thing I noticed about those moments in the desert with God in those formative years is that it's, the scriptures are silent about what happened in those, in those period of years. Like Moses, you get 40 years on the backside of the desert. We know he was shepherding his father-in-law's flocks, but beyond that, we don't have much information. For 40 years, it was kind of like that was a sacred thing between him and God for his spiritual formation. We, we aren't told anything about what happened in Arabia for the time he was there. Whether he was there the entire three years or, or not, I don't know. It, he was going back and forth with Damascus, but he uh, apparently was learning uh, directly from Christ himself. The other thing I noticed about this that is interesting is that it was for how long that, that he was, before he went up to Jerusalem? Three years. And I was thinking about how the other apostles who were Jesus' disciples, how long did they have with Jesus before they embarked on their public ministry? About three years. So in other words, Paul got his own little private audience with Jesus for a period of about three years, where, you know, when he says he's not less than any of the other apostles, he meant it. Because he got to spend time with Jesus, and he got to learn from Jesus. And he was sent by Jesus. You can also imagine that in those three years, you know, this paradigm shift that he had undergone, that everything changed for Paul. In a matter of one moment when he had that encounter with Jesus, his whole theology had to change. And so it probably took three years of being instructed by Christ and going through his own personal theology and getting it right to make sure that, uh, that what he was teaching was in line with God's word, or it is God's word. He also mentions there that in verse 22, that he was unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. So they only knew him by reputation. So they, even they hadn't met with him. And that's our final point, is this deposition. Notice their response, though. These Judean Christians says, but they only, they kept hearing, he who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they were glorifying God because of me. They heard of his reputation. You might think of this as a deposition, a deposition merely being uh, a sworn testimony of a, a witness that, that is recorded and then brought into the court record. Um, even though they may not physically be present in the court, their, their testimony is just as valid. 
And Paul is pointing out the testimony of these Christians that, and, and they testified through the reaction to what they heard about Paul. They testified that this could not have been the work of man. It had to have been the work of God. Because what did they do? They glorified God because of him. Couldn't have been the work of man. Nobody could have done what, what happened to Paul. Nobody could have been responsible for that. It had to have been God. So they identified the source of Paul's message without even personally knowing Paul. Well, in closing, what is the takeaway of a passage like this? I think one of the takeaways is that what's being argued here um, for, in, in front of the Galatian believers is just as relevant for us today as it was for them. God has preserved this record. The verdict that the gospel message comes from God, not from a man like Paul. He didn't originate it. Christ did. The other day I was on Twitter and um, there was a I wish I could remember more of the specifics of that tweet that I saw, but there was a tweet that was put out by one of the big names. It was like Elon Musk or one of those. And, and I just scroll in through the comments, and um, one of the comments, and I see this occasionally on Twitter, where someone will just throw in a Bible verse or throw in a quick little witness. It doesn't have anything to do with what they're talking about. But one person posted the verse, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And I looked at that verse, and I saw it had 200 likes, and I thought, Great. There's like 200 people who, you know, purposefully hit that like button. Probably Christians. And I scroll a little further, and right underneath his comment was a comment to his comment. And I, I wish I could remember exactly how it was worded, but it was something to the effect, no, John said, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In other words, um, and the way it was worded was kind of like, no, no, you, you don't know if Jesus actually said that. You don't know if that comes from God. We just know that a man named John wrote that. Giving this uh, equivalent of man's work over God's word. And that little comment had over 400 likes. Over double what the other one had. And it shows you what we're up against. There is a world of people who believe that this is just the word, the word of man. We, of course, believe it is God's word. And that the gospel is God's gospel. But the force of this, a passage like this, is that we not only believe that this is God's word and that this is God's gospel, but that we conduct ourselves in such a way that when we're handling it, we handle it as the word. We share it as the word of God and not merely the word of man. The Bible says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman, uh, right? Uh, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, what? Correctly handling the word of truth. There's a correct way to handle it. Because it's God's word. One of the most disappointing things, I think, to me as a pastor over the years, and as a Christian, really, even before I got into the pastor, I noticed this trend among Christians where many Christians cannot articulate the gospel. And I've heard Christians at times try to witness other people, and it's sometimes disastrous. The things that they say, I think, oh, no, that's so confusing. Don't say it like that. Don't say that. Of course, you and I, we don't have a direct line with Jesus like Paul did. He's not going to, you know, in whatever way he appeared to him or spoke to him, we don't have him doing that to us today or for us today. We have his word. That's why we have to study it. His word is right here. We study it so that we can be well-versed not only in the general truth of God's word, but very specifically in the gospel. Remember, we are, we're not apostles, but we are sent ones. As the Father sent me, even so send out of you. We're sent into this world by Christ with a certain amount of authority he's given us to share his word, to share his truth. That's like the main reason we exist. And so how is it that Christians who have been saved some, sometimes for decades cannot articulate the gospel? My father-in-law loved to tell a story emphasizing the importance of God's word in, in a witness, in sharing the gospel, about how he and a group of his friends who had been saved, they, they were part of the hippie movement, you know, and they got saved under a man named Pastor Oswald in his Bible class at Ohio University. And um, these young guys picked up a hitchhiker. They thought, let's witness to this guy. And so this, this guy gets in their car, and they're driving around with this guy, and they're 
they're telling him everything about the rapture and about the second coming. They wanted to win, but they, they just were so excited that they're telling him all this different confusing stuff. Somewhat disastrous, he said, looking back on it. Now they try to lose to it. But what they did is they took this man to Pastor Oswald, the man who had led them to Christ. And this man had a lot of questions, intellectual questions. He wanted answers to, and they thought, we'll take him to Pastor Oswald. He has all the answers. And they took the man to Pastor Oswald, and they said it was, it was enlightening how he dealt with the man. That instead of addressing all the questions the man had, he kept working that one verse in over and over. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He kept working it in over and over. And at some point in their conversation, the man accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior. And the lesson that my father-in-law took from that is it wasn't their power of persuasion that can win a soul. It was the Word of God. I think that's why when we witness to people, when we're sharing the gospel, the safest way to do it is by quoting Scripture. Sure, maybe giving some explanation of, of, of what it means when it says what it says, but... The word really speaks for itself, and a person can be saved just by hearing the word of God. I think we get away from that. I think we try to think of new models and ways we can share the gospel. And oftentimes, the biggest threat to the gospel is, is ourselves. Mm -hmm. Unintentionally deluding or di distorting the gospel by sharing it in a way that's confusing to other people. <clears throat> that same pastor, Pastor Oswald, he used to say to his young men when they were in training, He'd always say to them, men, you show people a picture of Jesus, but make sure you don't get your fingers in the way. In other words, don't obscure what is already clear. Don't get your fingers in the way. Just show them Jesus. But there's one contribution we take away from this that we can make to the gospel, and that is the testimony of our before and after. The contribution that we do make, we don't add anything to the gospel, but to help validate the gospel, to prove that it's real and that it's God's word is we let people see the transformation that's taking place in our lives. They saw the before, they see the after, and they know there had to have been something in between those two things, and they want to, they're, they're intrigued. They want to know what's the story, and that's when you show them the picture of Jesus. Your life can be one of the greatest evidences of gospel truth. Your transformation not only attract people to Jesus Christ, but it, it will bring people to the conclusion again and again that what happened to you could not have been the result of uh, any human uh, intervention. It had to have been the intervention of God. God had to have done something. I hope our lives are like that. I hope that people can see the before and after of our lives, the change that was wrought by the gospel. But again, the power of the gospel is the word itself, because it is the word of God. It's not the word of man. Father, we're thankful this morning for your word and for the Apostle Paul, who you gifted and blessed, like giving him the scriptures to record for us the, the, the truth of the gospel. Lord, we know it's your word. It's not Paul's. He never took credit for it. But as a vessel, what a, an amazing man that he was, Lord. I don't know that he's ever been rivaled in, in church history for his zeal and passion and as an evangelist, Lord. And may we go through this book learning from the Apostle Paul and, and, he, and not only learning from the, the transformation that occurred in his life, patterning the zeal, but just be holding fast the Word of God in our lives, handling it in such a way that is meticulous for fear that we could be an impediment to the gospel, Lord. Just by not knowing it well enough. Uh, we know it enough to believe it and get saved, but to understand the gospel, Lord, and all of its implications beyond just the, what it does for us the day we're saved, but the life change that occurs after the fact. Help us, Lord, to go deeper in this study into our personal apprehension of what the gospel is. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Appreciate all you guys, and look forward to seeing you next week. Don't forget, there is an informational meeting right after the service here if you're interested in that mission trip. Thank you.